Now there was a caste system on the island of Saint-Domingue. First up, you had Grand Blancs or Grand Whites. They were small in number, lived mainly in France, but had a lot of power on the island. Up next, you had the Petit Blancs. They were the poor whites who held a lot of local power and had power over the militias. Up next were the free people of color, who ranged in shade from the darkest of darks to the palest of whites. And because of this shading, they had up to 110 different classifications, ranging from mulattoes to octoroons and so on. Now these mulattoes, or mixed race people, held a lot of power in the island. They controlled the wealth and the land for the European planters. And even though they were given this power and whatnot, they were still subjected to segregation and racism. And the Petit Blancs hated the mulattoes, saying, how can these people of color hold more power and control than us? And finally, you had the enslaved population, who were worked so hard that the muscles pulled and detached from their bones. They were worked so hard and died so frequently that more and more enslaved Africans were brought in to replace them. Now this rapid death rate and importation of newly enslaved Africans set the stage for the Haitian Revolution. Many of these newly enslaved Africans had already known freedom in their homelands. Not only that, but many were soldiers and trained militarily. This set the stage for the Haitian Revolution before the French Revolution started. Starting in 1787, 40,000 Africans were enslaved and brought to the colony of Saint-Domingue a year. By 1789, there were roughly 32,000 white people on the island and over half a million enslaved Africans. And due to the brutality of slavery, the African population wasn't allowed to reproduce naturally, so they were constantly replaced. That means the majority of the enslaved population were African-born. That allowed African culture, religion, and spirituality to remain strong in the enslaved population up until the end of the French rule. Specifically voodoo, which was mixed with Catholic rituals. In 1685, the King of France instituted Code Noirs, which granted certain human rights to the enslaved population and made sure slaveholders gave them food, shelter, and clothing. It also regulated punishment. According to Henri Christophe, here's what punishment was like in the colony of Saint-Domingue. Now, Henri Christophe was born in West Africa, where he was later enslaved and brought to the colony of Saint-Domingue, where he was enslaved for over half his life. He was a key leader in the Haitian Revolution and the only monarch of the Kingdom of Haiti. According to him, this is what punishment looked like in the colony of Saint-Domingue. These are his words, a first-hand account of how the French punished enslaved Africans. Have they not hung up men with heads downward? drowned them in sacks, crucified them on planks, buried them alive, crushed them with mortars? Have they not forced them to eat excrement? And having flayed them with the lash, have they not cast them alive to be devoured by worms or onto ant hills, or lashed them to the stakes in the swamps to be devoured by mosquitoes? Have they not thrown them into boiling cauldrons of cane syrup? Have they not put men and women inside barrels, studded with spikes, and rolled them down mountainsides into the abyss? Have they not consigned these miserable blacks to man-eating dogs until the later, sated by human flesh, left the mangled victims to be finished off with bayonets? Lord have mercy. Now the French colonists were mostly men, and the thought of sending a proper white woman to the colonies was almost unheard of. They tried sending women before, but they were prostitutes, and you can't marry a prostitute. And a proper white woman wasn't going to live on the colonies. They had to be protected from the savage nature of the enslaved. So the French created a system called placage, or a legal entanglement, if you will, which allowed white men to legally shack up with women who were free, indigenous, or enslaved. And it got its start right there in the colony of Saint-Domingue. While in other colonies like Canada and Louisiana, they relocated young orphan women known as the King's Daughters. It wasn't just the orphans. France also recruited willing women from the farms and the cities. They were known as casket girls because they brought all of their belongings in trunks or caskets.
Now, the casket girls ended up in Louisiana and were considered white French Creoles. Now, white colonists who were not the firstborn son and needed to accumulate wealth they were allowed to get married were allowed to take women of color as consorts before they got married, or in some cases, after the wife died. Even merchants and administrators who had enough wealth did the same thing. Now, when these women of color would have children, they were sometimes emancipated along with the children, and some would even take the white man's last name. Now, when these Creole men reached a certain age, they were expected to marry white women. And some, if they had enough money, also kept their placage. See, it wasn't uncommon for white men to have two or more families. Sound familiar? Their mixed-race children became the basis of what we know in Louisiana and across the world as free people of color. Now, during and after the Haitian Revolution, many of these free people of color came to New Orleans and added a whole new wave of French-speaking Creoles to Louisiana. They came with rights and status and were often educated and were property owners. Their descendants later went on to hold positions of power in the city of New Orleans at the city and state level. They laid the foundations for what would later be known as the African-American middle class. As the number of free people of color began to grow, French rulers enacted discriminatory laws against them. Sound familiar? Now, these statutes forbade free people of color from taking up certain professions, marrying whites, wearing European clothing, carrying swords or firearms in public, or attending social functions where white people were present. While here in Louisiana, we had tie-on laws that prevented women of color from wearing their hair out in public. Sound familiar? Now, even though the French did all that, it didn't prevent free people of color from owning land. And because of this, they accumulated substantial land holdings, and many became slave owners themselves. By 1789, free people of color owned a third of the plantation property and a quarter of all the enslaved in Saint-Domingue. They settled in the southern peninsula where the earthquake just happened, far away from the Atlantic shipping lanes. And we're back. Don't let the lack of a beard fool you. I always shave for funerals. The French Revolution happened between 1789 and 1791. Let me know if you want a video on that. It's crazy. In July of 1789, a group of wealthy mulattoes left the colony of Saint-Domingue and headed to France. They went with the intention of getting the white planter delegates to grant them full political and civil rights. Sound familiar? They were led by Julian Raymond and Vincent Auger, who would later go on to become leaders of the Haitian Revolution. Unfortunately, the white planter delegates was like, No, silly, you don't need civil rights. You can stay a second-class citizen. <laughs> so Julian and them hooked up with a French abolitionist group called the Society of the Friends of the Blacks whose aim was to end slavery throughout France and its colonies. In March of 1790, the National Assembly granted full civil rights to free people of color. Now this sent ripples throughout French colonies, leaving white colonists shook. Now when word got back to the colony of Saint-Domingue that free people of color now had civil rights, these white French planners lost their minds. How can they do this? Granting civil rights to these uh, mulattoes. But when free people of color found out, they were super excited, saying that the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen makes them French citizens. And that just pissed the French colonists off even more. Now in October of 1790, Julian and Vincent returned to the colony of Saint-Domingue to enforce these new laws. But the royal governor was like, nah, <laughs> we're not doing that. And that ain't do nothing but piss Vincent and Julian off. So they got together with some of the blacks on the island and was like, yo, we got to do something about this. But everybody wasn't on board. You see, some of the mulattoes refused to free their enslaved Africans or even give them weapons. They refused to change the status quo of slavery in the colony. And this led to the Haitian Civil War. After the Haitian Civil War was well underway, Vincent Auger and Jean-Baptiste Chevalier tried to attack Cap Francais. But the mulatto population refused to arm their enslaved Africans. And with the help of a white militia, the Petit Blancs, they were defeated. After their defeat at Camp Francais, many escaped to the Spanish portion of the island, or what we call the Dominican Republic. But they were captured and returned to the French side. And in February of 1791, Vincent Auger and Jean-Baptiste Chevalier were executed by the French. On August 14, 1791, right there in the Alligator Wood, 
something magical happened, and I mean that literally. A voodoo priest by the name of Duddy Bookman presided over a ceremony in the woods with enslaved Africans. Now this ceremony was said to guarantee victory in the upcoming revolution. During the ceremony, animals were sacrificed and their blood was given for drink. A week later, 1,800 plantations were destroyed and 1,000 slaveholders were killed. These are the words spoken by Dutty Bookman during the ceremony in the Alligator Woods. The good Lord who created the sun which gives us light from above, who rouses the sea and makes the thunder roar, listen well, all of you. This God, hidden in the clouds, watches us. He sees all that the white people do. The God of the white people demands from them crimes. Our God asks for good deeds. But this God who is so good demands vengeance. He will direct our hands. He will aid us. Throw away the image of the God of the whites who thirst after our tears. And listen to the voice of liberty which speaks in the hearts of all of us. Just one week after this speech was given, 1,800 plantations were destroyed and over 1,000 slaveholders were killed. 